<clears throat> Good evening. Welcome to another exciting edition of uh, Billy Reads Books. I'm your host, Billy. Tonight we have my favorite novel, The Amazing Adventures of Cavalier and Clay by Michael Chabon. It's about these two cousins that uh, find each other in New York City during World War II. And they begin to write comic books together in protest of uh, Nazis, fascists, fascists. Anyways, let's see here. It's about halfway, uh, more than halfway through the book. Chapter 11 of uh, Act 2. Sammy, the writer, has uh, met a new friend. Uh, and uh, they're falling in love. Let's dive in. <clears throat> when Frank Singe, the head of production for Parnassus Pictures, came through New York City that September, Bacon got Sammy in to see him at Gotham Hotel. Bacon had kept Sammy up all night, writing out scenarios, and Sammy, bleary-eyed and poorly shaven, had three ready to go to s show Singe the following afternoon. Singe, a big barrel-chested man who smoked a 10-inch Davidoff Gigante, said that he had two writers in mind already, but that he liked what Sammy had done in the comics, and he would take a look at his pages. He was not at all discouraging. It was clear that he was personally fond of Bacon, and furthermore, as he said himself, it was not like the other two guys up for the job were Kaufman and Hart. After 25 minutes of semi-distracted listening, he told Sammy and Bacon that he had a very important appointment to look at a pair of very long legs, and the interview was over. The pair walked down to the street with the mogul from Poverty Row and stepped out of the Gotham into the dwindling afternoon. The weather had been fine all day, and though the sun had already set, the sky overhead was still as blue as a gla gas flame. With a flickering hint of black carbon in the east. Well, thanks, Mr. Singe, Sammy said, shaking his hand. I appreciate the time. The kid can do it, sir, Bacon said, reaching an arm around Sammy and shaking him in a little. The escapist is his baby. It was a cool evening, and in his defense, soft camel coat, excuse me, it was a cool evening, and in his dense, soft camel coat, with Bacon's arm around his shoulders, Sammy felt warm and content and prepared to believe that anything could happen. He was touched by the degree of Bacon's eagerness to have him come along to California, Though he suspected it, too, he worried that Bacon was really just afraid of being out there all alone. It was between them and... It was between them now, just as it had been with Joe before Rosa. Sammy was always available, always willing to join in, keep up, hang in there, go out and pick up the pieces after a fight. Sometimes Sammy feared that he was on his way to becoming a professional sidekick. As soon as Bacon had made a few friends, or a new friend, in California, 
Sammy would be left alone with the unhappy souls, pale, gaping goldfish, whom he had read about in Day of the Long uh, Day of the Locusts. Day of the Locust. Day of the Locusts. <sighs> Whatever you decide is fine by me, Mr. Singe, Sammy said. To tell you the truth, I don't even know if I want to move to Los Angeles. Oh, don't start on, on that again, Bacon said, with a big fake radio laugh. They shook hands with Singe, and he got into a cab. See ya, boys, around, Singe said. There was an odd note in his voice, hovering somewhere between mockery and doubt. The cab pulled away from the curb, and he waved a little, leaving Sammy standing there under the arm of his boyfriend. Bacon turned to him. What do you go and say that for, clay boy? Maybe it's true. Maybe I like it here. Boyfriend. The word flew into Sammy's mind and careened blindly around it like a moth while Sammy chased after it with a broom in one hand and a handbook on lepo lepidopery, lepidopery in the other. <laughs> it sounded like a wisecrack. Acidulous, hard-bitten, italicized. Who's your boyfriend, Percy? Though Sammy now spent all his free time with Bacon and had agreed in principle on their sharing a house in the event they did go west, Sammy still refused to admit to himself at that irrelevant senatorial level of consciousness where the questions that desire has already answered are proposed and debated and tabled till later. That he was in love or falling in love with Tracy Bacon, it was not that he denied what he was feeling or that the implications of the feeling had frightened him. Well, he did, and they had. But Sammy had been in love with men all, uh, nearly all his life, from his father to Nicola Tassila to John Garfield, whose snarl of derision echoed so clearly in his imagination, taunting Sammy. Hey, pretty boy, who's your boyfriend? However clandestine and impossible an enterprise it might hitherto always have been or seemed, loving men came natural to, naturally to Sammy, like a gift of language or an eye for four-leaf clovers. Notions of denial and fear were, in a very real sense, superfluous. Yes, all right. So maybe he was in love with Tracy Bacon. So what? What did that prove? So maybe there had been further kissing and some careful exploitation of shadows and stairwells and empty hallways. Even John Garfield would have to agree that their behavior since that night in the lightning storm on the 86th floor had been playful and masculine and essentially chast, chaste. Sometimes, in the back of a taxi cab, their hands might steal towards each other across the leather banquet, and Sammy would feel his small, damp palm and bitten fingers absorbed into the deep, sober, Presbyterian fastness of Tracy Bacon's grip. The previous week, when they were at Brooks, being fitted for new suits, standing side by side in their BVDs like a before and after advertisement for vitamin tonic, they had watched the salesman leave the fitting room, and the tailor turned his back, and when Bacon had reached out and grabbed a handful of the wool of Sammy's 
And then Bacon reached out and grabbed a handful of the wool of Sammy's chest. He had fitted the hinge of his fingers into the notch of Sammy's breastbone and run his palm down the flat slope of Sammy's belly. And then, hardening his blue eyes with an innocent Tom Mayflower twinkle, darted his hand into and out of the waistband of Sammy's briefs, like a cook testing a pot of hot water with a pinky. Sammy's cock retained, to this moment, a furtive memory of the imprint of that cool hand. As for kisses, there had been three more, one just outside the doorway of Bacon's hotel room as Sammy was dropping him home, one amid the dark latticework under the 3rd Avenue E1 at 51st, and then the third and boldest in the back row of the Broadway at a showing of Dumbo during the Pink Elephant Bacchanal. 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 Hmm. For here was the novelty, the difference between the love that Sammy had felt for Tesla and Garfield and even for Joe Cavalier. And that which he felt for Tracy Bacon. It really did seem to be reciprocated. And these blossomings of desire, these entanglements, these entanglings of their fingers, these four nourishing kisses stolen from the overflowing standpipe of New York's indifference, were the inevitable product of that reciprocity. But did they mean that he or Bacon was a homosexual? Did they make Tracy Bacon Sammy's boyfriend? I don't care, Sammy said aloud to Mr. Frank Singe, New York, the world, and then turning back to Bacon. I don't care. I don't care if I get the job or not. I don't want to think about it, or Los Angeles, or you leaving, or any of it. I just want to live my life and be a good boy and have a nice time. That all right with you? That's fine by me, sir, Bacon said, nodding his scarf against the chill. How about we go do something? What do you want to do? I don't know. What's your favorite place ever in the whole city, I mean? My favorite place ever in the whole city? Right. Including the boroughs. Don't tell me it's in Brooklyn. That's awfully disappointing. Not Brooklyn, Sammy said. Queens. Worse still. Only it isn't there anymore, my favorite place. They closed it. Packed it up and rolled it right out of town. The fair, Bacon said. He shook his head. You and that fair. You never went, did you? That's your favorite place ever, huh? Yeah, but... All right, then. Bacon hailed the taxi cab, opened the door for Sammy. Sammy stood there a moment, knowing that Bacon was about to get him into something he was not going to be able to get out of easily. He just didn't know what. We're going to Queens, Bacon said to the driver, to the World's Fair. It was not until they had reached the Triborough Bridge that the driver, in a dry monotone, said, I don't know how to tell you, fellas, this. Is there anything left? Bacon said. Well, I seen in the papers they've been arguing about what to do with the land between the city and Mr. Moses and the fair people. I guess some of it still might be there. We'll keep our We'll keep very low expectations, Bacon said. How about that? I'm comfortable with that, Sammy said. Sammy had loved the fair, visiting it three times in its first season of 1939, until the end of his life. He kept one of the little buttons he had been given when he exited the General Motors Pavilion, which said, I have seen the future. 
He had grown up in an era of great hopelessness, and to him and millions of his fellow city boys, the fair and the world it foretold had possessed the force of a covenant, a promise of a better world to come, that he would later attempt to redeem in the potato fields of Long Island. The cab left them off outside the L-I-R-R station, and they wandered along the fair's perimeter for a while, looking for a way in. But there was a high fence, and Sammy didn't think he could get over it. Here, Aiken said, crouching behind some shrubs and arching his back. Climb on. I can't. I'll hurt you. Come on, it'll be fine. Uh, come on, I'll be fine. Sammy scrambled up onto Bacon's back, leaving a muddy footprint on his coat. I have mystically augmented strength, you know, Bacon said. Oof. Sammy trembled and dangled and fell into the fairgrounds, landing on his ass. Bacon launched, hoisted, and dropped himself up over and down the fairground side of the fence. They were in. The first thing Sammy's eye saw out were the monumental Mutt and Jeff structures, the soaring Trilon and its rotund trum, the Perisphere, symbols of the fair that for two years had been ubiquitous throughout the country, working their way onto restaurant menus, clock faces, matchbooks, neckties, handkerchiefs, playing cards, girl sweaters, cocktail shakers, scarves, lighters, radio cabinets, etc., before disappearing as suddenly as they had flourished, like the totems of some discredited Millerite cult that briefly thrills and then bitterly disappoints its adherents with great, uh, with grand and terrible prophecies. He saw right away that the lowermost hundred feet or so of the trilon was covered in scaffolding. They're taking this tri-line down, Sammy said. Gee, which run is the trilon now? The pointy one? Yeah. I had no idea it was so tall. Taller than the Washington Monument. What is it made out of? Granite or limestone or something? Plaster of Paris, I believe. We've been doing very well, haven't we? Not talking about my leaving for L.A. Are you thinking about it? Not me. So the ball is the perisphere? That's right. Was there anything inside them? Not in the Trilon, but yeah, inside the Perisphere, they had this whole show. Democracy. It was like a scale model of the city of the future. And you sat there in the, those, these little cars going all around the outside and looked down onto it. It was all super highways and garden suburbs. You just felt like you were soaring over it all in a zeppelin. They would make it like nighttime in there, and all the little buildings and street lights would sort of light up and glow. It was great. I loved it. You don't say. I'd like to see that. I wonder if it's still in there, Sammy. What do you think? I don't know, Sammy uh, said Sammy, with a kind of wary thrill. By now he knew Bacon well enough to recognize the impulse and its accompanying tone that had sent his friend up to a military installation at the top of the Empire State Building at midnight with a gourmet meal in two shopping bags. Probably not, Bake. I think... Hey, wait for me! Bacon was already on his way around the low, circular wall that surrounded the immense pool, now drained and covered in a sodden-looking layer of burlap in which the perisphere once had swum. 
Sammy looked to see if there were any workmen still around or guards, but they appeared to have the place to themselves. It made his heart ache to look around at the vast empire, uh, expanse <laughs> expanse at the vast expanse of the fairground that uh, not very long ago had swarmed with flags and women's hats and people being whizzed around in jetneys uh, jitneys and see only a vista of mud and toplins and blowing newspaper broken up here and there by the spindly stump of a capped stanchion a fire hydrant or the bare trees that flanked the empty avenues and promenades the candy-colored pavilions and exhibit halls fitted out with saturn rings lightning bolts shark fins golden grills and honeycombs the italian pavilion with its entire facade dissolving in a perpetual cascade of water the gigantic cash register the austere and sinuous temples of the detroit gods the fountains the pylons and sundials the statue of george washington and freedom of speech and truth showing the way to freedom had been peeled stripped pr uh, prized apart knocked down bulldozed into piles loaded onto truck beds dumped into barges towed out past the mouth of the harbor and sent to the bottom of the sea it made him sad not because he saw some instructive allegory or harsh sermon in on the vanity of all human hopes and utopian imaginings in this translation of a bright summer dream into a immense mud puddle freezing over at the end of a September afternoon. He was too young to have such inklings. But because he had so loved the fair, and seeing it this way, he felt in his heart what he had known all along, that, like childhood, the fair was over, and he would never be able to visit again. Hey, Bacon called. Clayboy, over here. Sammy looked around. There was no sign of Bacon. Sammy hurried as quickly as he could all the way around the low whitewashed wall with its rain stains and patchy skin of wet leaves to the door of the trilon, which had been, which had led via an imperial pair of escalators into the heart of the magical egg when the fair was on there was always a huge line of people coiling up to these big blue doors now there were only the scaffolding and a stack of planks some workmen had forgotten the tin coffee, uh, coffee cup cap of his thermos Sammy went over to the metal doors. They were heavily barred and padlocked with thick chain. Sammy gave them a pull, and they did not budge in the least. I tried that, Bacon said. Under here! The perisphere was supported by a kind of T, a uh, ring of evenly spaced pillars joined to it at its and arctic circle so to speak all the way around the idea had been for the great bone white orb its skin rippled with fine veins like a cigar wrapper to look as if it were floating there in the middle of the pool of water now that there was uh, no water now there w there was no water you could see the pillars, and you could see Tracy Bacon, too, standing in the middle of them, directly under the Perisphere's uh, south pole. Hey, Sammy said, rushing to the wall and leaning across its top. What are you doing? The whole thing could come right down on top of you. 
Bacon looked at him, eyes wide, incredulous, and Sammy blushed. It was exactly what his mother would have said. There's a door, Bacon said, uh, pointing straight up. Then he reached up over his head, and his hands went into the bottom of the perisphere's hull. Bacon's head vanished next. His feet rose off the ground, and then he was gone. Sammy got one leg over the wall, and then the other, lowered himself down to the pool bed. The damp burlap made a squishing sound under his shoes as he ran across the gently curved bottom of the basin towards the perisphere. When he got under it, he looked up and saw a rectangle, uh, rectangular hatchway that looked as if Tracy Bacon might just have fit through it. Come on. It looks pretty dark in there, Bake. A big hand emerged from the hatch, wavering, fingers flexing. Sammy reached for it, their palms crossed, and then Bacon pulled him bodily up into the darkness. Before he could begin to feel or smell or listen to the darkness, to Bacon and to the pounding of his own heart, the lights came on. Gee, Bacon said, look at that. The systems that controlled the motion, sound, and lighting of demo democracy and its, com and its companion exhibit, General Motors Futurama, were quite literally the denier cry of the art and ancient principles of clockwork machinery in the final ticking moments of the computerless world. Coordinating the elaborate sound, tr uh, coordinating the elaborate soundtrack of voice and music, the motion of the cars and the varying light moods inside the perisphere had required an array of gears, pulleys, levers, cams, springs, wheels, switches, relays, and belts that was sophisticated, complex, and sensitive to disruption. A mouse dropping, a sudden snap of cold, or the accumulated rumblings of 10,000 arriving and departing underground trains could throw the system out of whack and bring the ride to an abrupt halt. Uh, halt occasionally trapping 50 people inside. It was because of the need for frequent minor addressments and repairs that there was a hatch in the perisphere's underbelly. It led into an odd bowl-shaped room where Bacon and Sammy came in. At the bottom of the bowl, there was a kind of corrugated steel platform on one side of the platform, a series of cleats had been welded onto the inner frame of the sphere that reached gradually up alongside, uh, along the inside of the bowl toward the elaborate clockwork underside of democracy. Bacon took hold of one of the lower cleats of the ladder. Think you can manage it, he said. I'm not sure, Sammy said. I really think... You go first, Bacon said. I'll give you a hand if you need it. So Sammy and his bad legs climbed a hundred feet into the air. At the top, there was another hatch. Sammy poked his head through. It's dark, Sammy said. Too bad. Okay, we better go. Just a minute, Bacon said. Sammy felt the sudden push from behind as Bacon took hold of his legs and more or less jackknifed him up into the cool, huge blackness. Something rough abraded Sammy's cheek, and then there was a creak and a series of rasping sounds as Bacon pulled himself up after. Huh, you're right. 
indeed. Sammy reached out along the ground, feeling for the hatch. Good. You're crazy, Bake. You know that? You just won't take no for an answer. I... Sammy heard the metallic chirp of the hinge of a cigarette lighter and the scrape of its flint, and then a spark swelled magically and became the flickering face of Tracy Bacon. Now yours, he said. Sammy lit his lighter. Together they managed to generate just enough light to see that they were camped far to one side of the display, in the middle of a wide, forested area half an inch high. Tracy stood up and started toward the center. Sammy followed him, protecting the kind, uh, protecting the flame. The surface of the floor beneath their feet was covered in a kind of rough, dry, artificial moss that was meant to suggest vast rolling hills of trees. It made a crunching sound that echoed in the high, empty dome. Every so often, though they tried to be careful, one of them stepped on a model farmhouse, or crushed the amusement district, or central orphanage of a town of the future. <laughs> Finally, they reached the major city, at the very center of the diorama, which had been known as Centerville, or Centerton or something equally imaginative. A single skyscraper rose from a cluster of smaller buildings. On the all the buildings uh, all the buildings looked streamlined and modern like a city on Mongo or the Emerald City in the Wizard of Oz. Bacon got down on one knee and brought his eyes level with the top of the lone tower. Huh, he said. He frowned, then looked, then lowered himself and leaned forward one arm slowly, taking care not to extinguish his flame until he was lying flat on his belly along the ground. Huh, he said again, grunting it this time. <laughs> he lowered his chin to the ground. Yeah, this is the way. I don't think I would have liked just floating over it near as much. Sammy went over and stood beside Bacon for a moment. Then he eased himself down on the ground beside him. He folded an arm under his chest and, inclining his head slightly, squinted his eyes, trying to lose himself in the illusion of the model, the way he used to lose himself in Futuria, back at his drawing board in Flatbush a million years before. He was a twentieth of an inch tall, zipping along the oceanic highway in his little anti-gravity sky fliver, streaking past the silent faces as the aspiring silvery buildings. It was a perfect day in a perfect city, a double sunset flickering in the windows and threw shadows across the leafy squares of the city. His fingertips were on fire. Ow! Sammy said, dropping his louder. Ouch! Bacon let his own flame go out. You have to kind of pat it with your necktie, dopey, he said. He grabbed Sammy's hand. This the one? Yeah, Sammy said. The first two fingers. Oh, okay. They lay there for a few seconds in the dark, in the future, with Sammy's sore fingertips in Tracy Bacon's mouth, listening to the fabulous clockwork of their hearts and lungs and loving each other. Well, that was a beautiful little love story. I can't recommend this book 
highly enough, Michael Chabon has written the great American novel. And very compelling characters exist in this book. I suggest that you read it. I'm going to try to keep reading it. <laughs> and uh, appreciate you. Like and subscribe. And uh, catch you on the flip-flop. See you next week.